If you don't know Guy Kawasaki, you should. Um, I know him as a co-founder of Alltop, which I love. Um, he was also a founding partner of Gar Garage Tech Ventures. And he's going to be talking with us today about his book, The Art of Enchantment. But he also happens to have nine other books? Uh, eleven. Eleven? See, I can't <laughs> even keep up with him. He's so prolific. So without further ado, let's listen to Guy Kawasaki. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, so it's very nice to be here, and the reason I'm here is because I love Peggy Kilburn so much. And <laughs> Peggy and I go back a long way, uh, all the way to Macintosh uh, in the mid '80s, if you can imagine that. So uh, I have been giving You're Peggy uh, moments of nervousness <laughs> since 1984, uh, but I showed up, right? I was on time. Okay. All right. So uh, my name is Guy Kawasaki. No relation to Donna Kawasaki. Uh, other than she does help me with my skating, and I can assure you that uh, I am a much better speaker than I am a hockey player. So, uh, of course, that's not saying that much. <laughs> so, a little bit about my background. I worked for Apple for uh, twice, actually, for four years the first time, and a couple years the second time. Um, I worked in the Macintosh division in Cupertino. So this meant that I worked for Steve Jobs, naturally, which was a very interesting experience, to use the word interesting very, very loosely. The Macintosh division was arguably the greatest collection of egomaniacs in the history of Silicon Valley. <laughs> and if you know a lot about Silicon Valley, that's really saying a lot. Uh, because we worked for Steve, we thought we were the special children of Steve Jobs. We had special rules, unlike any other part of Apple. Uh, unlimited supplies of fresh orange juice. We had a travel policy where any flight over two hours qualified for first class travel. Um, my interpretation of that rule is that the clock starts at the moment you leave your apartment. <laughs> so uh, I flew first class from San Francisco to Monterey all the time. Uh, <laughs> Back then, the company had the Apple II division, which was making all the money because it was shipping, and the Macintosh division, which was losing all the money because we were strictly R&D. Uh, and so if you looked at the Apple P&L in those days, the P was Apple II and the L was Macintosh. Uh, but we were such bad people, we would not let Apple II division employees into the Macintosh division building. So if you can imagine that, you're working for a company where you know, one part of the company can't go into the building of the other part of the company, and then those people who were paying for that building were not being allowed into the building they paid for. So as you can imagine, that upset them. Hence, they came up with a great joke about us, which is how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? Uh, the answer is one. The Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the entire universe to revolve around him. Um, there's a, oh, where's your list of sponsors? Is Microsoft a sponsor? They are? Yes or no? Peggy, you don't know? No? OK, so the Microsoft version of this joke. <laughs> is, because they won't be a sponsor after I tell you this. The Microsoft version of this joke is how many Microsoft employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is none, because Bill Gates has declared darkness the new standard. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, other than the speakers that uh, you've seen today, uh, you'll perhaps agree with me that, because I've been watching high-tech speakers for about 30 years. Uh, most high-tech speakers, they have two salient points. First, they suck, and second, they go long. <laughs> and that is a bad combination. If you suck and your speech is short, it's okay. <laughs> and if you're great and your speech is long, it's okay. But if you suck and go long, that's like being stupid and arrogant, you know? <laughs> it's just a bad combination. So what I do for my speeches is I always use a top 10 format. That way, if you think I suck, you know approximately how much longer I'll suck <laughs> because I have exactly 10 points. Um, and those of you who might be taking notes, uh, you don't need to take notes because I will provide a way to get a PDF at the end of this presentation. So there's no reason to take notes. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, of course, you could also buy the book, but that's a different discussion. But that's all right. So enchantment. So let me tell you about my history with enchantment. Uh, as a Macintosh employee, as a software evangelist, my job was to enchant developers, to make them write software or create hardware peripherals for a computer that in 1983 and 1984 had no installed base, came from a flaky company in Cupertino, where most people thought we were sitting there in beanbag chairs, wearing Birkenstocks, drinking white wine, and smoking marijuana all day, which is kind of an accurate description. Um, <laughs> 
And so I had to enchant people to suspend their disbelief in, in a computer that really didn't exist. So that was my first encounter with enchantment. Uh, in fact, even before that, I was in the jewelry business. And the jewelry business, though it deals with very expensive commodities, they are commodities. Gold is a commodity. Diamonds are a commodity. And so in that business, it was all about enchanting people with the elegance of your design. And subsequent to Apple, I became an entrepreneur, so I had to enchant investors, I had to enchant employees to come work for their startup, and I had to enchant customers to take a shot with a product that wasn't proven. Uh, I became a venture capitalist, a writer, and a speaker. So as I look back, all my life I've had to enchant people, meaning I had to make them trust me and like me and be able to, so that I would be able to influence their, their hearts and their minds and their actions and their decisions. So one day I decided to codify this. Um, I looked at How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I looked at a book called Influence by Bob Cialdini, and I decided that I would write something in the same genre because I thought it would merit documentation, particularly because of social media, that Dale Carnegie, all he could do was fill a ballroom full of people. Um, I can use Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and Pinterest and email and blurbs and uh, blogs and websites that you know, just weren't available to Dale Carnegie. So the technology has changed, and so has the state of the art of social psychology. So that was my point, to write a book like this. So uh, I am going to go through this top 10 of enchantment, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions, and I'll be more than happy to do whatever it takes, okay? So uh, there are three pillars of enchantment. Pillar number one is you have to be likable. This is a picture that I think really expresses likability. So, um, this is me, and I am with Richard Branson, and the scenario here is that he and I were in Moscow, both making speeches at the same conference, and he came up to me in the speaker-ready room, and he asked me the question that you would expect Richard Branson to ask you, which is, do you fly on virgin? <laughs> I, being the honest person that I am, I said, Richard, I don't know how to tell you this, but I am a United Airlines global service level customer. Global service is such a high category. We don't even know how we became global service. Like, we look down on 100K members because we are so up there, but we don't know how we got there. And so, Richard, I really don't want to jeopardize my status with United Airlines by starting to fly on Virgin America and Virgin Atlantic. And when I told him this, he got down on his knees and started polishing my shoes. <laughs> And so truly, this is the moment I started flying Virgin America. <laughs> now, Steve Jobs, for all the greatness that he is or was, it is inconceivable to think that Steve Jobs got on his knees so that anybody would buy a Macintosh or an iPhone, iPod, or iPad, right? I mean, some of you are from at and you know, Who got on whose knees, right? I mean, it, it's very, very different. Very different world. So I want you to just keep this image in mind about likability. Now, the start of likability is a great smile. This is called a Pan Am smile. This Pan Am flight attendant is not truly happy to see those people. <laughs> right? She's faking it. She has that kind of smile where you put a pencil between your teeth. That's what's holding that smile together. A great smile is a Duchenne smile. And a Duchenne smile uses a second set of muscles, the eyes. The eyes are the key to a great smile, not the jaw. So one of the consequences of a great smile and being enchanting and being likable is crow's feet. Okay, so you, you actually want crow's feet. Yeah. So. So if you remember nothing else from this presentation, just remember, crow's feet is a good thing. So you're not getting older, you're getting more enchanting, okay? <laughs> so this is a woman named Mari Smith. She's an expert in Facebook marketing. Um, my first choice, honestly, for this picture was George Clooney. If you ever see a picture of George Clooney smiling, he has crow's feet. Um, <laughs> But I found out that you have to pay a lot of money to use George Clooney's picture in a speech. So I asked Mari, and actually I sent her an email. I said, Mari, I have good news for you and bad news. The good news is I'm going to use you in my speech, or I want to use you in my speech. I'll tell thousands of people about you every year. That's the good news. The bad news is it's because you have crow's feet, Mari. <laughs> uh, luckily, she's a nice person. She let me use her picture. Point is a Duchenne smile. Next thing is 
you have to learn to accept others for what they are no matter how much jewelry they have on their face color creed sexual orientation social economic status if you want to be liked you have to accept others for what they are think about it have you ever really liked someone when you knew that they did not accept you for what you are they wanted to change you okay uh, this woman by the way works in the tourist areas of Edinburgh so if you're ever in Edinburgh look her up uh, she has a very good business model arguably a better business model than many companies I invested in the business model here is if you want to take a picture of her you have to pay her one pound so beats a lot of companies that were funded in Silicon Valley the third thing is to default to yes. Defaulting to yes means that whenever you meet people, you're always thinking, yes, how can I help you? As opposed to what can I get out of the other person? As opposed to how can I say no? You should always default to yes. Now, you may think, well, what happens if this person asks me to do something unreasonable? What happens if this person tries to take advantage of me? And I will tell you that um, over about 30 years, I've come to the conclusion that the upside of being more liked far exceeds the downside of being taken advantage of. And in my life, maybe five people have tried to take advantage of me. Arguably, those five people were not worth enchanting. So the upside is so much better. You should suspend your disbelief and default to yes. Always be thinking, how can I help you? Next step is to achieve trustworthiness because you can be likable but not trustworthy right so you could like a Hollywood celebrity you could like Charlie Sheen but not trust Charlie Sheen right? <laughs> it's a big difference between liking and trusting so the key to trusting is to understand the sequence of events the onus is upon you it's upon your company to trust your customers before you expect your customers to trust you three examples Amazon with Amazon in particular you can buy a Kindle ebook and you have one week to read that book. If you don't like the book, up to a week later you can return it. Full credit, very easy. Just go to your um, uh, profile part of your Amazon account and just return it. Very easy. Basically, Amazon is saying we trust you not to buy a Kindle ebook, read it, and return it. Because many people could do that in a week. And because Amazon trusts people not to do that, I think people buy many more ebooks than they might have. It's part of the policy. Now, if there's ever an audience to explain this, Zappos. So, how many of you do not buy shoes through Zappos? Okay, so 15 of you. Everybody else <laughs> buys shoes through Zappos, right? So at my house, we have one box coming in per week. Okay? <laughs> the beauty of this is we also have a box going out per week. <laughs> Unfortunately, the box going out is always smaller than the box coming in. But the point here is that millions of women trust Zappos, and they buy shoes without trying on the shoe or really seeing the shoe, right? And that to me is remarkable. Who would have thought that all these women would buy shoes without seeing them or trying them on? And why is that? It's because you trust Zappos. And why do you trust Zappos? It's because Zappos pay shipping both ways. What a remarkable idea in customer service. We pay shipping both ways. If you don't like the shoe, send it back. You don't have to call us for a return authorization number. You don't have to navigate our phone mail, voice tree. You don't have to do any of that. Just send it back. We'll pay both ways. So millions of women have come to trust Zappos because Zappos trusted women first. And the third example, of course, is Nordstrom. Brick and mortar, apocryphal a true story. The story is that someone once returned a used tire to Nordstrom. <laughs> I checked with Nordstrom. That is a true story. That's how much Nordstrom trusts you. And because we have come to trust Nordstrom so much, we probably buy a lot of things that are on the edge. You know, we're not sure we need it, but oh, it's so easy to return. They're so flexible. They're so trustworthy. Let's return it and see if we like it. And we end up keeping it point here is if you want to be trusted you have to trust first the next thing is to become a baker not an eater an eater sees the world as a zero-sum game such and such limited pie if you eat more of the pie I eat less of the pie therefore I have to eat as much of the pie as fast as possible eaters see the world as a zero-sum game 
Your gain is my loss. Bakers do not see the world this way. Bakers see the world as I can bake more pies. I can bake bigger pies. I can bake cookies. I can bake cakes. Everybody can get dessert. Bakers are more trustworthy than eaters because with eaters, you're always worried that they're trying to get stuff away from you, taking away from the pie, whereas bakers always believe we can have more dessert for everybody. Bakers are more trustworthy than eaters. And finally, you need to find something to agree on. You want to build up trust? You build up trust by finding something, no matter how small, to agree on. It could be a love of hockey. It could be, well, with Apple, I'll give you an example. In the mid-80s, Apple tried to make Macintosh successful as a spreadsheet, database, and word processing machine. We were zero for three there. What made Apple survive was desktop publishing. So all this page maker created a market called desktop publishing. Without desktop publishing, there would be no Apple today. With no Apple today, we'd all have phones where the battery lasted for a whole day. We'd have phones, you know... <laughs> We'd have phones with a real keypad. We'd have phones where the navigation actually worked. It would be a different world, right? <laughs> I think all this page maker was a gift from God to Apple because it saved Apple. And I believe in God. And one of the main reasons I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival. <laughs> so there are no atheist Apple customers. Trust me when I tell you this. So Apple finally found something to agree with the market, which was desktop publishing. Not spreadsheet, not database, not word processing, not CIO stuff. They found desktop publishing. Now you may be wondering, what the hell does this picture have to do with anything? <laughs> so the story goes, two Latin American countries, diplomatic crisis, they meet in a neutral third country. They make no progress for days. Finally, one chief diplomat, they're both males, one chief diplomat says to the other chief diplomat, I need to go home on Friday. I need to go home on Friday because I promised my wife I would take her to the opera. I hate the opera. My wife forces me to take her to the opera. The other chief diplomat says, oh, your wife forces you to take her to the, to take her to the opera too? My wife does the same thing. And I also hate the opera. So finally, in the midst of this diplomatic crisis, they found something to agree on. <laughs> the point here is to build trust, find something Thing to agree on. It could be hockey, it could be a dislike of opera, it could be desktop publishing. Find something to agree on. Step number three is to perfect your product, your service, your competence, whatever it is. And I tell you this because I learned firsthand that it is much easier to enchant people with great stuff than with crap. Okay? <laughs> it's very hard to enchant people with crap, even if you're likable and trustworthy. So, you should have great stuff. So, these are the qualities of great stuff. Great stuff is deep, lots of features, lots of functionality. You've anticipated what your customer needs as they come up the power curve. Great stuff is intelligent. When you look at it, you say, this company was thinking. They understood my pain. They understood the opportunity here. This is an analog example of intelligent product. I hope the people from Ford are in this room right now. So... Are you? Where? Okay. Tell Scott Monty I want one of these. But anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so this is a GT500 Shelby Mustang. 650 horsepower. Okay. This is really a just, there is no better word for it. This is a badass Mustang. This is <laughs> truly a smoking Mustang. And I would love to buy one of these. Asian American going through a midlife crisis feeling of... <laughs> Feelings of inadequacy. You know, what a great way to compensate for my feelings, right? <laughs> and for those of you who are not into cars, let me just translate what this car is. This is 6.8 Priuses. <laughs> okay, so I would love to buy one of these cars, but I have four children. My children are 8, 12, 17, and 19. The 17 and 19 year old both have licenses. And I know that no matter how carefully I plan it, there will be times when they might have to drive the car. And the thought of either of those boys driving a car with 650 horsepower <laughs> is just criminal. It's just <laughs> criminal. It's just not right. It would be unleashing two boys upon society in something that they cannot control. And so what I learned is that Ford makes a very intelligent product called the My Key. And what the My Key enables you to do is control the top speed of the car 
via the key. Yes. So, on those rare occasions when they drop me at SFO or something, I could give them a key for the car that could only let the car go 55 miles an hour. <laughs> Which, yeah. Now, in case, you, in case you want to do this with your Ford, you have to understand the key controls the top speed of the car, not how long it takes to get to the top speed. <laughs> So it'll still get there in about three and a half seconds, but it's a very intelligent product. Great products are also complete. It's the totality of the product. If it's software, it's not just the download. It's the APIs. It's the online community. It's the documentation. It's the totality of it. If you own a restaurant, it's not simply the food. You may be working with the union of the waiters and the waitresses. You may be working with an organic farm to provide you with better supplies. It may be the valet service that parks the cars of your customers. It's the totality of the restaurant, not simply the food. Great products are also empowering. They make you feel more complete. They make you feel more creative and more productive. This is the key to Macintosh. It makes you feel more creative and productive. It becomes one with you. It doesn't fight you like Windows. And finally, <laughs> there's elegance. Great products are elegant. Somebody cared about the user interface. So if you want to be enchanting, one of the best places to start is to create a dicey product or service, or for you yourself to be dicey, to be deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant. So those are the first three pillars of enchantment, likability, trustworthiness, and diciness. Now, the fourth thing is to launch your product or service. And I think the key to this is to tell a great story. You are all in technology, and I know that you've seen many a press release, many a product introduction, and every stinking one of them, there's some CIO or some CEO who says, we have patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, enterprise class, scalable product, right? <laughs> Everybody says that. It would be so refreshing if some CEO says, we have slow, buggy, hard to use, <laughs> piece of crap that we're introducing today. <laughs> At least you know you could trust that CEO, right? <laughs> But everybody says that, so it doesn't work anymore. So you need to tell a story. Why does your software exist? Why does your product exist? Why does your service exist? Because your spouse got cancer. Because you knew there had to be a better way. Because as the site administrator, you knew that there had to be a better way to verify identity. Some story. I'll tell you some classic stories from Silicon Valley. My buddy and I were frustrated. We couldn't use a computer unless we drove to a university or drove to a large company or worked for the government. Surely there must be a better way. Why can't computers be smaller and cheaper and easier to use? So we started Apple. Or my girlfriend wanted to sell her Pez dispenser collection online. There was no way for her to do it. So I started eBay. Right? Just FYI, it's a total bullshit story. But... <laughs> But it is nonetheless a great story. It is a great, great story. Tell a story, a personal story of why you're doing what you're doing. Next thing is to plant many seeds. You know, marketing 1.0 was top down. The way it worked is you sucked up to powerful people in the press. You hoped they liked your product. You hoped they reviewed it. You hoped they made your product. You know, the Wall Street Journal arguably made Lotus 1, 2, 3, right? It was top down. I think that that is totally reversed today. Marketing 2.0 is bottom up. Now, nobodies are the new somebodies. I'm not saying you should ignore the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and CNET, and Mashable, and, you know, Read, Write, Web, and all that other stuff. I'm not saying you should ignore them, but you shouldn't focus on only them. Because I think that the person that makes... New products, new services succeed today is, quote unquote, Lonely Boy 15. Lonely Boy 15 at AOL.com. Lonely Boy 15 has only 15 followers, not 15 million. Lonely Boy 15 still lives with his mother. Lonely Boy 15 sleeps on Buzz Lightyear sheets, okay? <laughs> Lonely Boy 15 has, however, 15 friends, and they have 15 friends. And if you can all get them to use your product called Instagram or Vine or Twitter, guess what? Someday, Lonely Boy 15 and his ilk and her kind of, you know, Tiffany 15 or... 
whatever, Biff 15, whatever it is, they make you tip. And at that point, guess what? The Wall Street Journal has to write about you. <laughs> and that's the way to think of things today. You know, Twitter would not be successful without Lonely Boy 15. Twitter is about seven years old today, right? And there is no way that you can find any article that's seven years old that says, we predict the total revolution of communications because of a product called Twitter. Right now, it enables people to send 140 character text messages like, my cat rolled over. <laughs> but someday, it'll be reporting about civil unrest in Egypt or Turkey or wherever there's oppression or wherever there's an earthquake or it's going to be the leading edge of news. Nothing like that is seven years old. Truth is, seven years ago, what made Twitter successful was that the people at South by Southwest used Twitter to find the best parties, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you believe this theory, you have to plant many seeds because it's easy to find Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher of the Wall Street Journal. It's easy. It's easy. Very easy. How do you find Lonely Boy 15? You have to put out a lot of seeds. In a sense, Lonely Boy 15 has to find you. Plant lots of seeds. Next thing is to always use salient points when you discuss what you do. On the left side, you see the kind of terminology that an industry likes to use. On the right side, you see how people would really like to get the information. So, for example, let's say you're in the food business and you have an organic, low-cal, very healthful product, right? So right now, if you go into the market and you turn over a bag of chips, the bag of chips says there are 300 calories in this bag. What does 300 calories mean? Like, many people don't really know. I'm not sure what it means, but I tell you what. If that bag said, if you eat this bag of chips, you have to run 20 miles, <laughs> I would understand what's in the bag. That would be a much better way to describe the caloric content of a bag of chips. Okay? Next thing. In not-for-profits, lots of not-for-profits like to say, the size of our fund is X million dollars. But you know what? If you're the donor, if you're the person who is considering giving money to the not-for-profit, you don't care about the size of the fund. What you care about is if I give you $500, it buys food for a family in Ethiopia for a year. That's what you care about, how many months of food. And if you're in the device business, I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning saying, God, if I only had 16 gigabytes of storage, my life would be complete. <laughs> People wake up in the morning saying, I wish I had something that's cool and thin and beautiful and it holds 10,000 songs and 1,000 movies and 100,000 books. They're thinking in terms of songs, thinking in terms of months of food or the number of miles you have to run. Use the salient points of your product. Number five is to overcome resistance to your enchantment. This picture depicts overcoming resistance to retailers stalking games. In the mid-80s, retailers did not want to stock electronic games anymore, so Nintendo realized it had a problem. What it did is it added a robot to its electronic game and repositioned it as a toy. Not just any kind of toy, in fact, an educational toy. So now, kids were asking their parents to buy them a Nintendo educational toy to learn robotics for Christmas. That is a much better pitch than buy me a game to shoot stuff up. Okay? That's how it overcame resistance. More ways to overcome resistance. Provide social proof. I think one of the genius moves of Apple, and I was not there, so I had nothing to do with it, is the white iPod buds, right? Because you saw white earbuds, you noticed white earbuds. White earbuds equaled iPod. The more white earbuds you noticed, the more you were comfortable with the thought of buying an iPod. At some point, you broke down and you bought an iPod, right? Just because resisting Apple is futile. <laughs> and so you, white, you bought a white iPod. And guess what? You added to the pool of white earbuds. So now more people saw white earbuds. So more people bought iPods. When more people bought iPods, there were more white earbuds. So more people bought iPods. So there were more white earbuds. It became this beautiful upward spiral. Provide social proof. 
When many of us send email with our phones, it says sent via AT&T 4G LTE network at the bottom of our emails, right? You know you can remove that. They don't make it so easy to remove that because they want that social proof in the email, right? Right. But that, that is another form of providing social proof. If you keep getting email and all these emails says sent with 4G LTE AT&T network, guess what you start believing? Everybody's on AT&T. Provide social proof. Next thing is to use a data set to, cho to change a mindset. Sometimes you're encountering ignorance. Sometimes you're encountering entrenched thinking. A data set is extremely useful for changing entrenched thinking and ignorance. Now, this is a graph that shows on the vertical axis the life expectancy in a country. The horizontal axis shows the number of children per woman. Okay? So this is 1950. And in 1950, it's fairly accurate to say that if you lived in the United States or Western Union, uh, no, Western, Union Western Europe, <laughs> you had a long life and fewer kids. If you lived in the rest of the world, you had a short life and many kids. There may be a causal relationship there, but we won't go there right now. So in 1950, you'd say, yeah, if you live in the United States, you have a long life and few kids. You live anywhere else, you have a short life and many kids. That's 1950. However, I believe to this day, many people still believe that. They believe people in India and Pakistan and, you know, they all have short lives and too many kids, right? Well, watch what happens over the next 59 years. The whole world is shifting. The big red thing is China. The light blue stuff is India. Okay, so by 2009, the accurate statement is most of the world has a long life and fewer children. It's not true in Africa yet, navy blue, but generally speaking, the whole world, we all have few kids and long lives. This is a very powerful example of showing how a data set can be used to change a mindset. So if you have data like that, that evolves, right, that if I were at and I keep using at and because I love at and So if you, if you wanted to show that there were, you know, more bars in more places and more 4G LTE coverage, I would show a data set that says, well, in, you know, in 2005, this much of the country was covered in 4G LTE. 2006, 2007, 2008, 2013, the whole country is blocked off. It's all 4G LTE coverage, right? That's the kind of way that you change people's impressions by using a data set. Next point here is to be sure to enchant all the influencers if you're trying to break down resistance. I think many people, particularly those led by VPs of marketing who are men, believe that the male, the father, is the decision maker. I think you'd be wrong roughly 80% of the time, right? It's really the mother. Sometimes it's the sister-in-law, sometimes it's the grandfather. I will tell you, however, in my family, just so you know, it is my daughter. Okay. So how many of you have daughters in this audience? Okay, so you, you probably understand when I tell you that my happiness is gated by my daughter's happiness. So I can only be as happy as my daughter is happy. Okay. That's the maximum I can be happy. So now I want you to, I'll show you, you know, I'll tell you something. A, a good speaker never gets off track, but a great speaker can get off track and come back. I'm going to show you that right now. <laughs> so, how many of you have taken your daughter or rented or bought to see the movie Never Say Never, Justin Bieber movie? How many of you? Like three of you in this? You don't love your daughter or what? <laughs> Okay, so five of you, five of you. I want you to suspend your disbelief. I want you to all rent or buy Never Say Never. It's a real twofer. For one, your daughter will love it. Secondly, you will learn more about social media and marketing and word of mouth than in any other movie I've ever seen. You will see how Justin Bieber was made a success by his mom using YouTube and Twitter. Not $100 million in advertising and promotion. YouTube and Twitter. 
you will see how Justin Bieber is mentored by his vocal coach. Very interesting. Some of you are mentors. Some of you are seeking mentors. Very interesting relationship to watch that. And finally, you'll see Justin Bieber's people go into the parking lots of concerts and give tickets to girls who don't have tickets for the concerts. And the pure joy that those tickets bring to those girls will just melt your heart. It'll show you true viral word of mouth marketing. So suspend your disbelief. Trust your keynote speaker and rent or buy, <laughs> never say never, okay? Now, number six is to make your enchantment endure. We're switching from Justin Bieber to the Grateful Dead. <laughs> the Grateful Dead has endured for decades. One of the reasons why it has endured for decades is because it enables people to pirate the concert. At a Grateful Dead concert, there's a specific area for tapers, not that anybody uses tape anymore. And so it has this special area so that people can record the concert and then share the music. While the rest of the music industry is suing little old ladies for downloading cello music, right? <laughs> the Grateful Dead is encouraging people to tape the concert and then share it. Because the Grateful Dead has figured out that the hardcore Grateful Dead fan came to the concert. So we should help them help us get more customers, more fans for the Grateful Dead by taping the concert and sharing the music. What a concept. Make your enchantment endure. Next thing is to build an ecosystem. Going back to completeness. You know, the total ecosystem of a software company is not simply the download. It's the consultants, the resellers, the VARs, the user groups, the online documentation. It's the totality of it. These people can do things that you are unwilling or unable to do. Think of the thousands of iOS developers and how they make iPhones better. Think of the thousands of Android developers who make Android phones better. Think of all that stuff that Apple or Google could not do. Build an ecosystem. Next thing to do is to invoke reciprocation. Invoking reciprocation is a very powerful way to make your enchantment last. The expert in this is a guy named Bob Cialdini. He wrote this book, Influence. This carpet depicts reciprocation. In the mid-30s, the country of Italy invaded Ethiopia. And when Italy invaded Ethiopia, the people in Mexico collected money and sent money to Ethiopia to help Ethiopia defend its country. About 90 years later, big earthquake in Mexico. Mexico was truly hurting, and the people of Ethiopia collected money and sent money back to Mexico. There's only one very important fact that's missing so far, which is Ethiopia was in the middle of a famine. So Ethiopia, people were dying from starvation, and yet they felt so strongly that they had to reciprocate to Mexico. When Mexico helped them, they collected money and sent money to Mexico. Another example, right after the Civil War, the people of New York bought the people of Charleston a fire truck. The first one was on a boat that sank, so they had to send them another one. They sent them a fire truck because they heard Charleston was using bucket brigades to fight fires. Fast forward to 9-11, what do people of Charleston do? They collect half a million dollars and they buy the people of New York a fire truck. Because 150 years later, earlier, the people of New York had bought the people of Charleston a fire truck. I'm going to give you two power tips about reciprocation. You will be my customer, okay? So let's say that I default to yes. Let's say that I'm a baker, not an eater. So I do something for you, okay? I help you in some way. You, of course, are a good person, so you thank me. So the question is, what do I say to her now? What is the optimal response when, response when she thanks me? It is not simply you're welcome. It is, I know you would do the same for me. I know you would do the same for me. I'm telling her she has class. She's a good person. I know you'll do the same for me. I'm also telling her, I know you will do the same for me. <laughs> Ladies, you need to squeeze the trigger. That is the optimal response. I know you will do the same for me. And then, and then, the next tip is, I need to enable you to pay me back. Because I, as a baker, as a defaulter to yes, I'm happy to do more for you, but I am not clairvoyant. So how do I know what else you want me to do? You, on the other hand, you have class, so you don't want to ask me to do more because you already owe me, right? So we're stuck. 
I want to do more, but I don't know how. You want me to do more, but you don't know how to ask me. So I'm actually doing you a favor if I could tell you, well, you know, this is how you can pay me back. Because by enabling her to pay me back, we clear the decks and she can ask me to do more. And we can take our relationship to a higher level. So the two power tips are enable people to pay you back. You're doing them a favor. And the optimal response when someone thanks you is, I know you would do the same for me. Two power tips for you. Next thing is, don't rely on money. If you are likable and you are trustworthy and you have a great product, you don't have to rely on money. I'm not saying you shouldn't pay commissions and affiliate fees and all that kind of stuff. Hallelujah, right? That can make things better and stronger. But the key, the foundations of your enchantment should be likability, trustworthiness, and quality. Don't rely on money because someone can always pay more and remove the people who you think are enchanted. Next topic is that great, great enchanters are great presenters. Some tips about presentation and speaking. Number one is customize the introduction. In the first five minutes, show that you truly know where you are, who you're talking to. Somehow customize the introduction. I like to do it with pictures. So this is a picture of my LG washer and dryer. The scenario here is that I was in Brazil speaking to the LG management of Latin America. And Unfortunately, I was not clever enough to take a picture of the LG washer and dryer that we own in advance. So I was already in Brazil. But I have these two teenage boys, the same teenage boys that I would not want them driving a Mustang, right? <laughs> so I thought I'd invoke a little reciprocation, enable them to pay me back, right? Because I know they would do the same for me, right? And so I send my boys a text message saying, go downstairs in the house that I bought you. Turn off the Xbox that I bought you, where you're playing Assassin's Creed that I bought you. Take the iPhone 4s that I bought you. And take a picture of the washer and dryer that I bought you, okay? So I send them a text message. You have to understand my two boys. My boys are Nick, Noah. Nick is 19, Noah 17. So I send a text message to follow up to my older boy. Nick, did you get my text messages? Nick responds, oh, Noah said he'll take the pictures. And since you're talking to LG, can you get us TVs? <laughs> Welcome to my life. Welcome to my life. My son is always closing, right? And then you can't see it over here, but the third response from me is, you know, there's defaulting to yes, and there's baking, not eating, and there's pure stupidity, right? <laughs> So my response was, doubt it. So anyway, the point here is that these pictures worked very well with LG, right? Because I was an LG customer speaking to them in Brazil about enchantment. Worked. Some more pictures. When I was in Russia with Richard Branson, I opened up with this picture in Moscow, and I said, you Russians, I had no idea. You really have big balls in Russia, right? <laughs> it's kind of a Putin-esque thing. And when I was in Scotland, I opened up with this picture showing that I was investigating their delicacy, haggis, which is not something I recommend. <laughs> I actually found out about this Crombie's um, through Andrew Zimmern's Bizarre Foods. How many of you watch Bizarre Foods? It's a great show. I love Andrew Zimmern. Uh, but this is my favorite picture of all, showing how you can open up a speech with pictures. This is a picture of me in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul. So let me explain what's going on here. So obviously I'm in the front. I have a fez. The person behind me is the shopkeeper. He has glasses on. You may not be able to see, but I'm telling you, that guy is happy. <laughs> that guy has a Duchenne smile. Let me tell you what's going through his mind. Okay? He's standing there thinking, this dumbass American is going to buy this fez. <laughs> this fez has been in my shop for three generations. I finally found somebody stupid enough to buy this fez. <laughs> Needless to say, when you speak in Istanbul and you open up with a picture like that, you win the audience. Okay, point number one, customize the intro. Point number two, sell your dream. No more patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, enterprise class, scalable products. Sell your dream for what your product, your service can do. The benefits of it, not the features of it. When Steve Jobs introduced an iPhone, he never said it's $188 of parts manufactured in China under somewhat suspicious conditions, okay? <laughs> he 
position an iPhone is cool and thin and beautiful and there's an app for that. It'll hold a hundred thousand books and ten thousand songs and a thousand movies. It'll change your life. He sold the dream for hundred eighty eight dollars worth of parts. People were thanking him for selling him, selling that phone. And finally, the 10, 20, 30 rule of PowerPoint. 10, 20, 30 rule of PowerPoint is the optimal number of slides in a PowerPoint presentation is 10. 10. Be lucky to get 10 points across. 10. Now, you're not stupid. You're looking at me with like little daggers of hypocrisy, right? So like, <laughs> guy, you're saying use 10. How come you're number 40 right now, right? Let me explain. You're not me. Okay? <laughs> You should be able to give these 10 slides in 20 minutes. Sure, you have an hour. I understand that. Most meetings are an hour. But guess what? To this day, Sandy's still here? To this day, you know, 95% of the world uses Windows, right? And so if you use Windows, guess what you need? You need 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. <laughs> right? Is that not true? Is that not true? So, if the whole world were Macintosh, this would not be the 10, 20, 30 rule. This would be the 10, 60, 30 rule, okay? But I had to write it for the lowest common denominator. I had to figure that lots of Windows laptops needed lots of time to make it work with the projector. So I couldn't allocate 60 minutes for the time length. And finally, 30. 30 point is the optimal size font, okay? Not 8, 10, or 12. Use 8, 10, or 12, too small. Too much text. You're going to read the text. Guess what? One slide into your presentation when the audience has figured out that you're reading the slide, the audience is going to say, this bozo is reading the slides. This bozo is reading verbatim. I can read silently to myself faster than this bozo can read it to me. Why do I need to listen to this person? And you will lose your audience. Now, if you want a rule of thumb, instead of strictly 30 points, figure out who the oldest person is in your audience. Divide his or her age by two. Presenting to 60-year-old people, divide by 230. 50-year-old, 25 points, right? Someday you may be pitching a 16-year-old VC. That day and only that day. God bless you. Use an eight-point font. <laughs> but until that day, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30-point font. Number eight, use technology to enchant people. Dale Carnegie had a ballroom at the New York Hilton. We have Google+, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Tumblr, hallelujah, man. Step number one, remove the speed bumps. This is a speed bump called CAPTCHA. How many of you have encountered CAPTCHA registering for a website? Yes, all of us. What is the purpose of CAPTCHA? It is to reduce the number of customers you have. Okay. <laughs> so this is an example of CAPTCHA. Word number one is probably Holber, no problem. Word number two is what? How many of you know what language that is? Okay, so like more people have seen the Justin Bieber movie than know that language, okay? That is Hebrew. Of the four people with Hebrew knowledge, how many of you have a Hebrew keyboard? Okay, so two. So two out of 400 here, 500, could get past this capture screen. Why don't you just say to people, we don't want you to create an account? I'll show you a company that has over... Oh, by the way, Hebrew, the word... I don't, do you know that word? Yeah. It's the Hebrew word for obstacle. How ironic is that? <laughs> right. So this is a company called Sungevity. They install residential solar panels, and they have overcome a speed bump. One of the speed bumps in something like this is the first meeting, right? You have to set a time. You have to show up. They have to show up. They look at your roof. They do all that kind of stuff. It's kind of a pain in the butt. Sungevity, you just give it your home address. They look you up on a satellite photo. From the satellite photo, they can look at your roof. They can look at which way is southwest. They can make an estimate of how big a solar panel they can put. From that, they can estimate the cost and the power. All you did was give it a home address. Remove that speed bump. Second thing is, I think the key to enchanting people using social media is to always provide value. Not that your cat rolled over, not that you have a special promotion, but you always want to provide value. You need to become a great curator of information. That if you were in charge of social media for Virgin America, and the Bellagio has a great exhibit of Egyptian art, you should tweet out that, you know, come to Las Vegas, go to the Bellagio, see this great exhibit of Egyptian art, right? Or if, if, 
Virgin America opens up a, a new flight to Dallas, you know, tweet out. Oh, so this, you know, on Thursday night, did you know that the Dallas Museum of Art is open till midnight? I don't know if it is, but there's some of the, well, there's a museum in Dallas that's open to midnight, right? You don't know? Because you're always working at at and you never get to go to museums. Okay. <laughs> See, so if you're following Virgin America, you'd know that. So... That's what you do. So if you're following Virgin America and they keep telling you about, oh, this is a great exhibit in, in Dallas or this is a great thing in, at the Bellagio or something. So pretty soon you follow Virgin America, not because you're, you know, pimping out promotions for fairs, but because they enhance your travel experience. Let's say Real Simple Magazine runs an article about how to pack for a weekend and they show you how to fold stuff and what stuff to bring and what stuff not to bring. If I were an airline social media site, I would tweet out a link to that thing from Real Simple, how to pack for a weekend, right? So you have to provide information. Or you provide insights. What does it mean that this just happened? Or you provide assistance. How to make something good happen or how to avoid a bad thing. You, th you should think like NPR. NPR provides great content all year. Wait, wait, don't tell me. Fresh air, tech nation, this American life. Great content every day of the year. Some days of the year it runs the telethon. We don't want to hear the telethon. We don't like the interruption, but we tolerate it. In fact, some of us even reciprocate to NPR by donating during the telethon. Can you imagine any other company running a telethon in the middle of their content, right? Nobody could get away with that. And it's because NPR provides such great content the whole year long. I don't think anybody in here really cares about getting the Eton hand crank radio so that if there's a nuclear attack, you can find out when you're going to die, okay? <laughs> None of us care about that radio, but we tolerate the telethon. So you need to provide such value that they tolerate your infrequent promotion. That's what it is. You earn the right to promote. Next thing is some tools, uh, some rules of engagement. I think you have to do this fast. I think the life of a tweet is about five hours. Google Plus posts, five hours. Email, 48 hours. You have to do it really fast. You have to remember to do it flat. Yes, if the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post writes you, of course you answer. But if lonelyboy15 at AOL.com writes you, do you answer? And the answer should be yes, because lonelyboy15 could make you tip. And finally, you have to do this all the time. Not when everything else is done. Social media is core to marketing at this point. Number nine, how to enchant your boss. The key to enchanting your boss is when your boss asks you to do something, you drop everything else. I'm not saying this is fair. I'm not saying this is optimal to your organization. I'm just telling you, this is how to enchant your boss. You don't have to do anything else but do this. You would enchant your boss. And you could, when you go home tonight, you tell your husbands that I said this. So, <laughs> when a man's wife asks him to do something, he should drop everything else <laughs> if you want an enchanting marriage. A man should never argue saying, what I'm doing is more important than what you're asking me to do, honey, because he is wrong. Okay? <laughs> Tell your husbands, Guy Kawasaki said, when I ask you to do something, you drop everything else. Okay? Next thing is to prototype fast. So, if you ask someone to do something for you, if an employee does it, if that employee is truly trying to enchant you, they would prototype it fast, right? So, pretend you're asking someone who works for you, I need a PowerPoint presentation. In a couple hours, if that person prototypes and brings back a textual version of the presentation with some graphics dropped in, that's a good thing. That proves that the person dropped everything else. It also gives you more time to fix it rather than getting the PowerPoint as you're getting into the cab to go to the meeting. This is a good thing. Prototype fast. Next thing is deliver bad news early. The concept that you should tell your boss the bad news just before it happens is flawed. Because the people think, I'll deliver the bad news just before it happens at the last possible moment because prior to the last possible moment, the miracle might occur. Okay? The miracle never occurs. The earlier you deliver bad news, not surprising your boss, the better it is because you have more chance to prevent the bad news. 
Number 10, how to enchant people who work for you. I learned the most about this from Daniel Pink in this book called Drive. And in Drive, he basically says, pay people adequately, but if you want to take them to the next level, you want to make them really loyal and love working with you, then you provide a map. The three key points of map, mastery. You come work for me, you will master new skills. You'll be working autonomously, independently. We don't breathe down your neck. And we work towards a higher purpose, not simply making a buck. So you come work for me, you'll master new skills, working autonomously towards a higher purpose. That's how to enchant someone who works for you. Next thing you do is you empower action. You enable people to make decisions and do things for the customer. This is the Nordstrom approach. Empower action. And finally, you do the dirty job. You're willing to suck it up. How many of you watch Dirty Jobs? Dirty Jobs is a great show. And what makes Mike Rowe so enchanting is he's willing to do the dirty job. He'll go to the paint factory, the poi factory, clean the outside of a building. He'll get the dead rats out of the sewer. He'll perform artificial insemination on chickens, pigs, llamas, turkeys. <laughs> He'll do whatever it takes, right? Wouldn't you like to work for a guy like Mike Rowe who you know would do the dirty job because he is willing to suck it you want to enchant your employees, suck it up. Be willing to do the dirty job. And don't ask people to do something that you yourself would not do. This is my second to the last slide. I learned today that there's a signing after this. So I want to explain something. This is the cover of Enchantment. And I am going to sign your book, Resisting You is Futile. The reason why I explain this is because people have trouble reading my handwriting. And I'll tell you a story how I learned this. A few years ago, I had another book, and I used to sign the book, Kick Butt. Okay? So it would be, you know, Donna, Kick Butt, Guy Kawasaki. Right? That's how I would sign it. And then one day, after signing a woman's book, she came back to me and said, Guy, why did you sign my book, Nice Butt? <laughs> I'm not making this story up. Really. And I said, well, lady, it's because it's true. You have a nice butt. <laughs> so just in case you can't read my writing, it says resisting you is futile. Now, I'll, be ha I'll sign your book, kick butt, nice butt, whatever you want. But usually I signed it, resisting you is futile. Now, you might wonder why I signed the outside of the cover. And the reason is, number one, it's faster. And number two, to me, the whole reason to get a book signed is to show off that you met the author, right? Duh, why else would you do it, right? So what good does it do if it's on the inside? Who's going to see it? You want it on the outside, you know? Someday when you're successful, buy a red Ferrari. Don't buy a white Ferrari. You know, if you're going to go for it, go for it. So put it on the outside. Resisting you is futile. And then this is truly my last slide. So if you want the PDF of this presentation, just drop an email to tests at mayall.com. Tests at mayall.com. And if you're on Windows and you can't open it, you're on your own. Okay. <laughs> also, the person who makes my slides is a wonderful graphic artist. And so if you ever need slides like this, uh, her name is Anna Frazao, and this is her website, Anna FXFZ. She's a great, great graphic designer from Brazil, lovely person. So PDF and slides. So to wrap up, the three pillars of enchantment are, as I said, trustworthiness, likability, and quality. So I love Apple to this day. The quality of Apple, right? Macintosh, great computer, beautiful, thin computer, right? Only someone who's forced to would use one of those big, thick, black, ugly plastic computers, right? Apple for quality. What about trustworthiness? Zappos. Think of Zappos. Women buying shoes without trying them on. What a concept that boggles my mind to this day. And then likability. Remember Richard Branson getting on his knees so that I would fly on Virgin, polishing my shoes with his jacket. So you want the likability of Richard Branson, you want the trustworthiness of Zappos, and you want the quality of Apple. And that is the art of enchantment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.